So, our last subject before, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm the only thing that separates you from lunch. So, in order not to draw your ire on me, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Let me just start with a little uh, uh, observation on the empirical record since we're talking about the performance of um, financial uh, intermediaries before. So, the empirical fact is that of all the investment funds quoted at the New York Stock Exchange, if you take the average, they performed worse than the average of the, of the Dow Jones. Okay, so if you invest your money uh, with, a hatch, with, a, with an investment fund, in average, you get a lower performance than if you just invest your money yourself there. And if you so do without the sophisticated techniques that they bring along. We have a similar surprising uh, result when we turn to uh, deflation, it is one of the most uh, firmly held convictions among economists, and monetary economists in particular, that deflation is very bad and needs to be uh, prevented at virtually any cost. It's the basic rationale, one of the basic rationales underlying uh, Keynesian macroeconomics, and it's one of the basic rationales underlying uh, the uh, prevailing monetary institutions particular, the president of a central bank uh, and of uh, paper money, the purpose of which is uh, to fight deflations, prevent precise uh, situations in which we have uh, either a uh, strongly falling price level and or a strongly declining money supply, which has the consequence of a price level that is lower than it would otherwise have been. Now, uh, if we, uh, there has been a very interesting study published last year by uh, two Berkeley economists, or at least one of them was a Berkeley economist. It's been published with the NBER in the United <coughs> States, which proves again that occasionally mainstream economists can do uh, useful work. It's not really economic theory, but at least bring about the results that are helpful or interesting. And so what they found out in examining uh, historical episodes of deflation was that they are not systematically correlated with depression. Okay. So uh, the, uh, the empirical record uh, shows us that there's something fishy about the official story, which is that deflation, in any case, is just is the economic nightmare, is the economic is the scapegoat that justifies not only monetary policy, but also uh, our present monetary institutions, in particular central banks and paper money. So we need to take a closer look, then, at the theory of deflation and um, if we turn to the Austrian uh, theory uh, of money, we find indeed good reasons to believe that uh, there is no sy systematic link between depressions and deflation. The deflations are far less dangerous economically than they appear in the light of uh, uh, the Keynesian hystericalist scenario. And that in fact their true significance, the true the political sif significance is, is a different one and the one that is uh, commonly communicated. Now, uh, deflation has been, uh, despite uh, its role as a scapegoat, has been a uh, subject has been notoriously under-researched by economists. So it's only in the, in the past uh, two years or so that economists have turned again their attention to the theory and to uh, the history of, of deflation. Um, it has been, it seemed to be a subject that was just part of the, the bad old days before the Keynesian revolution for a very long time. And only after the stock market crash of 2001, more and more economists came to believe that despite all institutional safeguards that we have created, again, paper money in particular and central banks, there might be a danger of uh, deflation looping around the corner. So from the Austrian side, uh, we too, we have uh, organized a, a symposium on uh, deflation and the proceedings have been published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, uh, Volume 6, Number 4, 2003. So for those of you who want to look this up, and this is good stuff. Uh, now we, as Austrians, had the great advantage of uh, being able to, to base our uh, more recent research on the works of Mises and Rothbard. And uh, if it's true that Austrian economics is superior to all other schools of economic thought in general, this holds true in particular when it comes to money. In no other field is uh, the Austrian theory uh, 
not only so much better, but also leads to radically different conclusions, practical conclusions, than uh, mainstream uh, approaches than in the field of money. Uh, so reason enough for us to have a closer look here. And I will uh, start uh, by uh, recalling to your minds what Professor Hoppe had uh, said yesterday uh, in his lecture on money, or then in the lecture on banking, that one of the um, main propositions of monetary theory, at any rate from the Austrian point of view, is that the quantity of money in itself ultimately does not matter. Okay? That's the fundamental proposition. Whatever the money supply is, any money supply can uh, satisfy the exchange services, or can render the exchange uh, services that any size economy uh, might need. And uh, the reason is that money, you know, the, the services that we derive from the, uh, from the money supply vary according with its purchasing power. Okay, so that's a, and the purchasing power itself is not a, a physical characteristic of, of the object that serves as money. Right? If I have a wonderful uh, monetary object like, like this one, right? Right? so for, for this one I can uh, I buy a decent bottle of wine in France right now, does not mean that somehow physically the ability to buy a, uh, whatever, a bottle of Chinon uh, 2001, of my favorite brands with, with, this, with this paper ticket, um, is somehow physically linked up with it, rather this can change, right? Prices can change, and so I might be able to buy more or less of this uh, in the future. Uh, and this was, in fact, one of the reasons, uh, one of the ideas, the central ideas of the classical economists, uh, to uh, uh, to stress this fact, and here in particular Jean-Baptiste de Say, who came up with the following thought experiment that is still useful today and is still widely used, uh, in which we uh, consider two different economies, let's say one economy A and one economy B, and we have exactly the same real structure in both cases. We have the same economy, and let's say so there's one tomato, And there's uh, one, uh, one chair, and there's one car, and one fridge on the market. And so in economy A, we have certain prices that are a function of the money supply, which we might assume to be 1,000. And 1,000 can be anything, 1,000 ounces of silver, let's say. And so the tomato price would be let's say uh, 0 0.5, the chair price would be 10, the car price would be 200, and the fridge price would be 50. Okay. Now we assume if we contrast to this case an economy B that is exactly equal but only has a different money supply, let's say the double of the money supply, then we could argue, okay, the, the money prices will be exactly double there are reasons to believe that it will not be exactly double, but we don't have to care about this now. Right? So the point of the whole exercise is just to illustrate that um, uh, the quantity of money, changing the quantity of money, will change the money price. It does not directly affect uh, the supplies of real goods and services. And of course, we can also imagine an economy C, where the money supply will only be half, and then accordingly adjust our prices in this way. Now, let's look at uh, these uh, facts from two points of view, one from the point of view of the consumer and then from the point of view of the producer. From the point of view of, of a consumer, it is clear that in the economy B, which has a higher money supply, his revenue will be higher than in the economy A. Right? He will nominally have a higher revenue. But on the other hand, he has to pay higher prices for consumer goods as well. So his real position, his real revenue, will be exactly equal than in the economy A. And inversely, in the economy C, he would have a lower revenue, but he would also have to pay lower prices for consumer goods. So therefore, again, it can be indifferent as, as to the position. 
Now let's take the point of view of the entrepreneur. What counts for the entrepreneur is not the absolute level of prices per C, but as Professor Hopper has observed yesterday, price spreads. That is, the entrepreneur does not care about, well, let's say he is a chair producer, he does not care about the price for, for chairs. He cares about the relation between the price of chairs and the prices he has to pay for the factors of production needed to produce chairs. Okay? Now, in the economy where uh, the money supply is double, in the economy B is the money supply is double than in uh, economy A, he obtains higher prices for chairs, but he also has to pay higher prices for factors of production. So there's no a priori reason to assume that he will make higher profits or lower profits. Right? And the economy C, the same thing. Uh, the prices uh, that he obtains for his product are lower, but the prices that he has to pay for all factors of production are lower as well. So again, his, his revenue or the profit that, that's he, uh, that he derives uh, will uh, not a priori differ from the profits that he would derive in any of the other economies. Now this, lady and general, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason why the classical economist paid attention in their analysis of the economy only to real factor. They completely neglected the monetary side. Right? Because the simple illustration right, was sufficient to demonstrate uh, for them that uh, money has no impact right, on, uh, on the real economy. In particular, they arrived at the crucially correct insight that by increasing the quantity of money, and we cannot improve our overall economic situation. That is, we cannot improve the economic situation of the aggregate. Okay? So here we are, then we have the first action of monetary economics. Uh, the quantity of money per C or variations of, uh, of the quantity of money do not improve nor deteriorate the economic performance of the aggregate. This performance is ultimately determined by real factors. And at the same point, we have here also the central point of disagreement with all the Keynesians. Because the fundamental premise of Keynesian economics is that by modifying the quantity of money, you can improve the economic performance of the aggregate. Right? That is why Keynes stressed in his general theory of employment, interest, and money right, that um, uh, he was demarcating his, his, his venture from those of the classical economists say, well, they were just reasoning in a static uh, framework, I'm interested in the, in the performance and the dynamics. Right? So the question whether I, whether we can by economic policy and here monetary policy in particular, improve the, uh, the outcome of the aggregate. Okay, so that's the central point. So therefore all the, the whole uh, uh, debate around this is of central uh, practical importance. Now the second action, uh, two, two fundamental actions of monetary economics, the first one I just uh, enunciated. The second one has been also mentioned by Professor Hopper, and that is the action that variations in the quantity of money have a differential impact on the members of society. Okay? So even though I do not uh, improve or deteriorate the overall performance of the economic system by variations in the quantity of money, I do by necessity have a redistribution effect. And as uh, the, the eco relative economic position of different members of society will be affected by these variations of the money supply because the money supply, the new money supply arrives first in the hands of certain uh, market participants and from there on spreads onto the other, onto the rest of the economy. Uh, these effects or redistribution effects are commonly called Cantillon effects after Richard Cantillon. Mm. who um, in the early 18th century wrote a book with the title The Nature of Commerce in General, in which he placed great stress on, on these effects. Now, Cantillon's message has never been completely uh, forgotten, but the uh, classical economists thought they could uh, ignore this, or thought in any case that it was not very important. It was only Ludwig von Mises who uh, brought uh, these effects again to the fore, and stress in particular that the Cantillon effects are the root cause of intertemporal misallocation uh, of resources, about which we've talked this morning. 
Um, and then are also of crucial political significance, right? because we here we have a source of conflict between members of society. Who should be the recipient first? As soon as we have a central bank, uh, it is clear that whatever the policy of the central bank is, whatever um, uh, investment projects it subsidizes with new issues of money, new credits, and so on, it is exercising a discriminatory, discriminatory uh, decision in favor of some members of society to the detriment of other members of society. And Mises himself stressed that this was a fundamental problem of all monetary unions based on paper money, because it was to be accepted that there would be a constant redistribution struggle between the different nations or the different groups organized within uh, the monetary union. And in fact, that is something that's a crucial uh, a flaw of the present uh, European monetary system, of the European Central Bank and the, and the Euro, that in fact the uh, ECB has the uh, arbitrary power to favor certain groups at the expense of all other citizens. So it has this power, and so necessarily its policies will be sub, uh, substance matter for endless strife. It's something that is not discussed by monetary economists because they love, of course, central banks and paper money right, as instruments of uh, the application of their, of their own theories. Okay, so after these general remarks, let me just go through the main cases uh, that exist for deflation and then show by case by case, case for case analysis that uh, why there are good reasons to believe that we don't have to worry overly much about deflation for economic reasons. We can start by first considering deflation in the sense of a decrease of the price level brought about from the real side, that is from the, uh, from the good side. Right? Um, and then turn to considering uh, the monetary side, the demand for money first and then the supply of money. So we have causes of deflation, now deflation understood in the today conventional sense, decrease in the, in the price level, there are good reasons to use the word deflation in a more narrow sense, meaning a decrease in the money supply, but we don't have to worry about these definitional things, right? Uses of words and so on, that's not very important. So we have here the first cause is growth. Growth at a constant money supply then we have a second cause that is hoarding. A third uh, cause is uh, a decrease of the money supply, so of MS, as we say. <coughs> And um, and then we have also a fourth cause that is uh, interventionism, monetary interventionism. So here. Uh, the third cause would be a decrease of the money supply brought about by, constant, uh, by a conscious decision of the, of the money producer. The fourth uh, cause would be a more or less uh, involuntary uh, uh, consequence of previous government intervention. Okay, we start with the first uh, cause, so we have economic growth. And this allows us to deal with the most widely held uh, misconception about deflation, namely that an, a growing economy requires a growing money supply uh, to operate smoothly. Right? So the idea is, it's kind of a correspondence idea, a correspondence theory. Right? You have here a blob that is the volume of trade. Okay? And this must correspond to, somehow to, to the money supply. If this grows, then this must grow too, unless it will be impossible to sell all these goods and services here. 
Okay? But that is, ladies and gentlemen, that, that's nonsense. Right? Because it is very well possible to sell all goods and services, as we have said before, by uh, simply decreasing the money prices at which these goods and services are sold. So if the quantity of goods and services goes up due to economic growth, these will be uh, sold at ever lower prices, thus permitting to, to buy and sell them all with the existing money supply. I mean, all that happens is that prices decrease. Now, the crucial question is, of course, how can this be? Doesn't this put, um, how, is this, how is this possible for entrepreneurs uh, to do this? How can they operate profitably if they have um, uh, to pay factors, uh, prices for factors of production now and only in the future when the uh, greater supplies of goods and services come to the market, prices will go down. How can they operate profitably? And the simple answer can be summed up with the word anticipation, anticipation. Right. So entrepreneur, one of the essential tasks of entrepreneurship, or you can say the central task of entrepreneurship, is to anticipate future prices. If entrepreneurs anticipate that prices will go down in the future, well, then they can pay only uh, uh, lower prices for factors of production now. Okay? And the next step, next problem that appears is, well, what if the factor owners do not agree? And right? if they say, well, I, I, I will not sell whatever, my labor, or I will not rent out my land to you at this lower price. I don't agree with your anticipation. Well, the answer to this question is well, there's nothing wrong with this. If they don't go down with their price, well, it means that they have a better employment uh, for their property than on the terms offered by our entrepreneur. Right? So we can say, okay, we have an entrepreneur here and we represent his investment project with a time X, he will sell here and now he's buying factors of production. And if he does not, if he is if he's unable to buy the factors of production that he needs to, to complete his project uh, at lower prices here in the present, well, it means that the factor owners, let's say a worker, right, has a better alternative. Uh, for example, he can just stay at home. Right? He refuses to work. He has savings and so on. He will not work uh, for this lower wage rate, or he will work for, for another entrepreneur that offers him higher wage rates. Right? So the only reason why people would be unwilling to trade with him at the lower prices that he proposes is that they have better alternatives. And there's nothing wrong with this. Right? And that is so in any uh, business environment, right? whether it's inflation or deflation, what else, uh, monetary stability, whatever. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with it. What is clear, however, is if this anticipation is correct, if prices will indeed go down in the future, well, then sooner or later the factor owners, for example, the workers, will be unable to find anybody offering them better terms. Okay? So sooner or later then, they will be forced to accept the terms offered by our entrepreneurs who offer only lower recompensation in anticipation of the future lower prices. Okay. So there's no reason to anticipate any problems of a growing, for a growing economy within a deflationary context. There's nothing inherently impossible to arrange ever lower prices for factors of production uh, in a deflationary economy. Now, as far as the labor market is concerned in particular, there the deflationary impact will be lowest. Uh, why is that? Well, because um, labor is the most a universally usable uh, factor of production. Uh, so it can be used to, uh, in, in production processes that are very close to, to completion. So in the first order production processes, uh, companies that produce consumer goods, uh, and also companies that produce producers' uh, goods. And uh, well, if we would have to say, uh, in anticipation of a lower price in the future, this will have an uh, all the more low, uh, greater impact on uh, factors of production used way back here in the production chain. Okay, so if we anticipate a price decrease here at the end of the production, 
this will have an ever greater in impact on the prices paid for factors of production there because we have to discount the prices by the interest rate. Okay, so it will have a greater impact here. And so it, a deflation will impact especially raw materials and so on, but not so much uh, labor because the labor is constantly, constantly the alternative of mo working here or here. Right? So there's constant arbitrage processes going on. Uh, the same uh, alternative does not exist for raw materials, let's see, uh, say iron ore or something, which can be used only here. So uh, these uh, raw materials, will, their price will, de will decrease very strongly in a deflationary environment, whereas the price of labor, which is universally usable, will not decrease that much. That is the reason also why real wage rates will increase, right? All other prices will decrease much stronger than the uh, nominal wage rates. So we have a constant increase of real wages, which is exactly what uh, economic growth is all about. Now that's my main story already. And therefore, I will only illustrate that the same um, reasoning holds true also for all other cases. Um, most importantly, the case of hoarding. What is hoarding? Hoarding is an increase of the demand for money. Right? It's a pejorative expression for saying that the demand of money goes up. What is the demand of money? The demand of money is our evaluation of a money, uh, quantity of money relative to other goods. Right? So if I have a higher demand for money, this means that uh, I'm ready uh, to work more or to sell more of my other property to get a given unit of, of money. Uh, and inversely, I'm only ready to pay lower prices for a given unit of um, of money that I bought before. An example. Let's say before my uh, demand of money went up, I bought one tomato for 0 0.5 ounces of silver and I worked one hour for, uh, let's say, two ounces of silver. Okay. Now, if my de demand for money goes up, what does this mean? Well, it means that I'm ready to buy tomato only if I get it at a lower price. Right? So, for example, if I pay this price. On the other hand, I'm ready in order to obtain the same amount of money. And now I would be ready to, to work longer. Right? So, for example, I would be ready to, buy, uh, to, to work 1.5 hours. to get two ounces of silver. What does this mean? It shows that the purchasing power of, of money, by the very fact that, that my demand for money increases, goes up. Right? Because now I can buy tomato, at, uh, tomato can be bought on the market for 0 0.4 ounces of silver, and two ounces of silver can buy 1.5 hours of work, whereas before they could buy only two. Right? That is, here again we see that the the, the services rendered uh, by money are self-adjusting, self-adjusting to variations in the demand for money. There's no reason to um, accommodate a change in the demand for money by changes in the money supply. Right? What is just simply changing is the purchasing power of money. We do not have to accommodate the changes in the demand uh, for, uh, for money with changes in the money supply. We can just leave the money supply what it is. Okay. And very similar cons uh, considerations also apply if the money supply decreases. Right? There's no reason to believe that entrepreneurs cannot anticipate a decrease in the money supply if this should ever happen. Empirically, it's a very rare circumstance. Okay? But there's no reason to anticipate or to believe that entrepreneurs should be unable to do this. And they would adjust to such an expectation in exactly the same way as they adjust to re uh, secular growth and to increased uh, hoarding. Right? They would simply cut down prices for factors of production. And this could occur quite simply as, um, uh, as any other change. I won't talk about the fourth reason, interventionism, because we are here mainly concerned about the technical argument. So what does this leave us with? It leaves us with the notion that um, deflation per se is not economic, economically more harmful than any other 
change occurring in the economy. It does not put the entrepreneurs before fundamentally different or more serious problems than any other major change occurring in the economy. Right? And it, especially if uh, deflation is, is constant and, and secular and so on, it's very easy to adjust to it, just to any uh, other business environment. So what is then the main, um, the main uh, significance of deflation if it is not economic? Well, the main uh, significance is that it uh, jeopardizes or it can jeopardize the economic position of those entities, whether business entities or governments, that uh, rely in their operations on a high debt ratio. An entrepreneur that is heavily indebted uh, is confronted through deflation to uh, uh, the problem that at the lower price level that comes into being through deflation, he will be unable to, re to pay back his debt. Let's say I have a uh, situation A, in which the price level is 100 in my index, and in a situation B, the price level is 50. If I contract a debt in the, in the situation A, and now uh, we get through de uh, deflation to a situation B, well, very probably, I will be unable to pay back my debt. Okay? So deflation is, more often than not, I mean, there are exceptional s scenarios that we can imagine, but more often than not, the death sentence for all entities that are financed primarily through debt and not through equity. Deflation is no problem for entrepreneurs financing their operations through equity. Okay? But it's a problem for all those operating on debt. Now, if you think of it, well, who are these entities operating basic, uh, mainly on debt? Well, particularly, we have to think here of governments. Right? And we have to uh, think of the business units that are by and large financed through fractional reserve banks, through bank credit. Right? So this opens up then a completely new perspective on the now political significance of, uh, of deflation, right? namely that deflation is in fact, uh, from a libertarian point of view in, at any rate, a very desirable outcome because it cuts off the roots under those undesirable elements of society that shouldn't be in the positions of power that they presently have. Right? It's, uh, it's the way the market clears uh, uh, the bad plans, right, uh, drives them out and makes free uh, the way for, for new entrepreneurs, for a new establishment. Right? One if, uh, effect of, um, uh, of inflation, that's a political effect of inflation, is in fact to preserve the uh, existing structure of owners within, an, uh, within a society. Right? Inflation is the most important means by which the present economic and thus political establishment stays in power. And if you read very carefully Keynes, you'll find that that was in fact one of the driving motivations, one of uh, uh, the, the main ideas that inspired him uh, to campaign against deflation. Right? Keynes saw very clearly that inflation has this revolutionary impact on society too. He didn't like inflation for this reason. But he saw that deflation has exactly the same impact. Right? It brings about uh, a change in the structure of ownership. New, there will be a new economic elite, a new establishment that comes into play. Right? So the deflation and inflation are then forces by which we have something like a circulation of elites. Circulation of elites. This is an expression that has been coined by Wilfredo Pareto, neoclassical economist, a mathematical economist, ladies and gentlemen, but he had a great insight. Right? So there is in a market economy, in a free economy, you have a constant circulation of elites. Right? Those people with the best ideas and the greatest profits drive out people with inferior ideas or uh, produ uh, products that are considered by the consumers not as being as important as, as their products and so on. What inflation does is to keep the existing establishment artificially, for an artificially long time in, in its present position. And Keynes, convinced as he was that he and his friends were indispensable for, uh, uh, for the well-functioning of British society, well, became a great advocate of, of the fight for monetary stabiliz stabilization. 
And that was what prompted him to say, well, we need to get rid of both deflation and inflation because both are forces that somehow bring disorder into society. The wrong guys get to the top, right? but we need us. So again, right, so the, the, the significance of, of deflation is not economic. We don't have to worry about uh, deflation making it impossible for an, economy to, for an economy to function well. But it has a great political significance in that it is, so to say, the last resort for a free society where the political institutions don't function anymore. Right? Where for the political institutions don't assure the circulation of uh, elites and where for uh, the institutions such as paper money and central banks, we have no more adequate circulation of elites within the economic sector. Their deflation comes into play uh, with a big uh, cut and clears the field. Now it's one o'clock, I've achieved my goal, communicate the essential ideas. And uh, well, actually it's 12.59, so we have one minute for a question. There's a question here. Hello. Um, if uh, inflation causes uh, increasing uh, nominal interest rates, you should expect that deflation causes uh, or perhaps could cause negative interest rates, nominal negative interest rates. If that is the case, how can you then make anyone safe at all in banks, since you can gain more purchasing power from having your money outside? Mm. Yeah. Well, inflation, um, uh, deflation can never create a negative interest rate, precisely because nobody would lend us money at these terms. So even in the case of deflation, you would observe some nominally positive interest rate, be it ever so small. Right? Otherwise, there would no deal would be struck. It's very simple. Right. But OK, then again, empirically, we have to say, well, so what? I say, a decrease in the money supply is a very unlikely event. Decrease, uh, an increase of economic growth, which would just lead to a, a secular decline of the price level, that is much more likely, but doesn't pose a, a great problem for, for interest rates. Right? They would be somewhat lower, might be between 1% or 2%, but would still subsist. Um, uh, strong deflations come at very short notice are very uh, uh, important usually ha happen after a periods of inflation of the money th supply th through banks fractional reserve banks in particular but these are rather short periods so typically we're talking here about periods of uh, eight months to about two years All right, so that's if we look at the historical record that's about the, the period that we're talking about uh, and during this period, it might indeed often be impossible that any credit is given on, on, at interest and so on. But again, so it only reinforces the position of people operating with equity rather than with debt. So there's no problem there, whatever, right? So from an economic point of view, there's no reason a priori to favor debt finance business rather than equity finance business. Right? We have no means to say, well, that is better than the other one. We'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Good. Bon appétit. Thank you.